Thank you so much for coming, everyone, this evening. We're really thrilled to have such a nice turnout for this artist talk. Um, this is for our exhibition titled El Museo at SVA. And the invitation came from Mark Tribe, the director of the MFA program at SVA. And he emailed me and asked if I would be interested in organizing an exhibition at the galleries here. And really, the only stipulation was that one of the artists should be um, a graduate from the MFA program. And so we talked, and I said, you know, we could make both of our missions, of both of our institutions, really dovetail beautifully in this exhibition if we think about picking as many SVA um, MFA grads as we can, or people who attended SVA at some point, and um, think of artists who would also be very comfortable in our galleries at El Museo del Barrio. And we already had a relationship with artists who have graduated from the MFA program here. Since 1999, El Museo has organized a biennial. It's had various titles. It was originally called the S-Files, um, which stood for the selected files. In our curatorial offices, we have a giant wall. It's probably the size of this wall that's filled with artist files. And these are artists who've sent their materials to us because they're interested in exhibiting at El Museo del Barrio. And so often we draw from those files for our biennial. And um, so originally it was going to be an annual exhibition, but it was really a lot of work, so they decided <coughs> to make it a biennial, and it's been really successful. And we've always kept close attention to what's happening in F MFA programs around New York City and paying attention to Latin American and Latino students who are coming out of those programs. So it was a natural partnership. Some of the artists that are in the exhibition we've shown at El Museo before, others we never have. There's a combination here on the panel specifically for that purpose. And the idea tonight is really just to have a very informal conversation with the artists. I sent them a few questions myself ahead of time so they could think about what they were going to talk about. But I'm encouraging a dialogue with the audience also. So, you know, when we get bored of our questions, we'll just move on and ask the audience to jump in and ask questions. Um, and I'll just introduce them by name. Really, this is Manuel Acevedo. Next to him is Casey Tiedemann. Denise. Um, Goren, no wait, Denise Treisman Goren, two last names of mine, and Alejandro Guzman. I'm really thrilled to have them all here on the panel with me. They represent very different ways of working, but I think they have affinities also, which is nice. Um, so I'm just going to start by asking the first question, which is, I thought, you know, one of the things that's really interesting for people to know about the way artists work is to know about their process. And so I asked each of them to think about what is the most important part of their working process as an artist that they think is most important for people to know. So who wants to start? Was, all right, I'll start. Um, <laughs> I guess as far as process, um, I usually wake up, have a cup of coffee, and just let uh, intuition kind of just ring and and uh, start off with like drawings, like quick little sketches. And it was something that um, uh, Lucio Pozzi had told me. I don't know if he's in the grad department at uh, Fine Arts. Is he? No? No? Not anymore. But um, he had a profound effect on my, um, I guess, affect into the eight hour kind of like artist day. And, and it is work. and. You do have to stop, even though you're cooking, you know, arroya bichuela, you're still thinking about your sculpture you just made and how crappy it is, but uh, you want to move on to the next one or something. So, um, so it was always about intuition. And um, I was like one of those kids when I was growing up where it was just like a lot of Oreo cookies, a lot of sketchbooks. No one like really looked at them because you're, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade or something. So it's nice to see someone that um, would say, hey, these are, you should keep going, you should keep going, and just not worry about what anybody else would say about the drawings, even if they were crappy stick figure drawings or really good, you know, hand drawings or whatever. So for me, it was just more about sticking to intuition as far as like daily process, I guess, you know. Since you brought up the drawings, do you want to say a little bit about the grouping of drawings that are here in the exhibition? They're in both of the vitrines against the wall over there. Yeah, those were, um, I guess, uh, like I said before, um, as you wake up and just do a whole bunch of drawings, depending on, you know, what the 99 cent store, you know, notebook uh, I purchased that week or something. And we're just kind of just 
you know, uh, if I had a dream or if I'm having a conversation with an imaginary person in the studio um, or a girlfriend I don't have or something like that, <laughs> um, just to do something, to do something. And so those, I guess, on the right-hand side um, was like in those eight-hour seminar courses and you don't really like your your grad school thesis advisor and you're like, damn, and so you just keep drawing and drawing away and, and hopefully, uh, you know, through repetition, uh, I say it's like the mother of all learning is just, uh, you know, just to keep going and keep going. And so that's what those were studies for performance, uh, performance work, sculptures, um, I don't know, 10 cent uh, therapy fees instead of seeing a therapist, um, stuff like that, you know, when I was in grad school, I guess. That's great. I think it's really important, this idea of that there's a, a work day attached to the artist's work and that it's not just get up whenever and do whatever, you know, that there is um, an attention that's paid to the amount of work that gets done and the only way to really get more work done is to really concentrate on what's being done. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the notebooks, I think, is a really interesting issue also. It's something that eventually can become an exhibition in its own. And I wondered if um, anyone else on the panel has mm. thought of their notebooks as these important uh, kind of objects that stand on their own almost as work of art. Yeah. Um, uh, I tend to, I have a particular practice as well. I have several notebooks happening simultaneously. So I, um, my interests will vary from like hermetic 17th century drawings to uh, one point, two point perspective. And I'm also thinking about language and the way we kind of construct our, our lives around language and we navigate through language. And my particular project that I've been uh, doing in the past uh, 10 years actually started as a journal where I read through a military dictionary um, for about a year and a half, I held on to that book, and then I made entries from 2006 to 2008. I didn't bring my journal. However, um, I made lists of words that I thought were really interesting acronyms, kind of play on slang, street slang, everyday common language, and how we kind of take on this kind of authoritative language as our own, and we start implementing it in different ways. And so, uh, eventually, my list of words started to become small-scale drawings of uh, uh, labyrinths, uh, where I literally sketch out, I code out the word, so I, I take abstract uh, versions of the word and I, I um, extrude them, so that then I can think about them as multi-dimensional spaces. Uh, and then from there, I usually do drawings like this. And so I usually, literally, I start with a small sketch. Uh, uh, so I've been accumulating books for the past 30 plus years. I started as a photographer and uh, my primary work was documentary work. And then simultaneously, I was kind of hanging around where old graffiti, the, the graffiti movement was happening in, in Newark, New Jersey, around 19, uh, 1982, 83, where I kind of uh, hopped on board. And fortunately, I was introduced to some graph writers at Sydney Janis around that time. Uh, it was already the golden age of graffiti in New York. So uh, some galleries were already showing it, though it was very limited. Um, so my books have served, now I'm going back, I'm saying this is wonderful, I can die tomorrow and know that I have all these books that actually I value more than my finished pieces and if I live another 30 years I can always go back to those books and that's what I'm doing now. So with my photographic projects I'm actually giving them a second wind and I'm bringing some of those images out and recontextualizing it. and. Um, I noticed that I always edit my books in a way in which I always focus on these key elements when really sometimes the, the narrative is much more interesting when I show each page and, and, and think about how that story is being told or how it unravels or my interests are shown. Uh, and so um, they're, they're valuable journals uh, which I feel will tell a greater story uh, in the future. But I hold on to them so, you know, it's interesting you said that about keeping your books as a youngster. I found, interesting enough, while I was moving, I found a book that my first perspective drawings when I was in eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, I was taught by, I only went to parochial school for three years, couldn't stand it. 
I never knew why nuns were so angry that they love God the way they do. And, and why they would pull my ears and kind of yank my neck or with my tie. And then I, I, the, my favorite part was like, I think it was Friday afternoon, the priest, I forget his name, he would come in and, uh, and he'd show us how to do one point, two point perspective. It was like the highlight of the week. I always look forward to it. So, um, so that's part of the process anyway, small part. <laughs> Yeah, those notebooks, I think, become the basis for things like retrospectives in the future, so it's good to keep those around. I actually have no notebooks. You don't keep notebooks? I don't good. Tell us about your process. I don't sketch, and I don't doodle with just like with a pen or anything like that. I feel like my work is in constant, constantly changing and in process all the time, so my way to like sketch is with the objects themselves in space. So I take a lot of pictures of that, so I mean, Obviously, I could print those, maybe, and then that would eventually become like a notebook. But I don't have the habit to like have paper, which is weird for an artist to like not even have like I, you know. Sometimes I see on the subway like an artist sketching or whatever, and then I'm like, well, I really don't do anything close to that. What helps me most is like to step backwards, take photographs, and then like decide between those, I guess. But um, yeah, I also do street interventions, which in a way I also consider like sketches because they help me a lot develop the language that I do now inside the studio too. So, you know, there was no pressure in reacting to some object that you would find on the street, making a few marks, taking a picture and leaving it there as something completely ephemeral. Mm -hmm. So maybe those are also a little bit of my sketches, although I would never try to like recreate that inside the studio, but it was a way to get some sort of freedom and develop a language. And I mean, I speak of them a little bit in the past because I'm not doing those kind of actions that often anymore, which doesn't mean I could, I have stopped. It's more like, I feel like I've already gotten to a point where I don't need that previous step to be able to make what I want to make inside the studio. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. I mean, I think for me, the most important part is to walk a lot. And I try to go everywhere I, I go, I try to walk because I need to encounter my objects in a very spontaneous manner. So the only way that that could happen is I'm just going somewhere and I see something and then I have to pick it up. And sometimes I hide it on another trash can, <laughs> thinking that another artist might pick it up. Which, is actually like nonsense because it's trash. <laughs> but you know, I feel like I've dragged it closer to my next location so it's safer. And it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I, people that walk with me also, when I was in school, a lot of my classmates were like, you walk slow. I'm like, dude, I'm looking. Like it's part of my work. So like I'm not rushing unless I really need to go somewhere, of course. But I think that's part of it. Like just like uh, being very, conscious about everything. I mean, it's, sometimes it's not the object itself, but the way that things are placed or just like things that happen on the street that will then influence my solutions in the studio. Mm -hmm. I feel like the photographs that you take sort of become an inventory of ideas. So in a way they function as a kind of notebook that comes after the idea is sort of already drawn out in space, in three-dimensional space. What is it about the um, encounter with an object in the street that might draw you to it over something else, something different, a particular thing that you have to stop and hide somewhere so that no one else will <laughs> take? Well, I don't always do that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, um, I think, I mean, there's formal qualities of the objects that I'm attracted to. Like sometimes it could be a shiny surface or the quality of the material that I could see it, or sometimes it's something else I have in the studio that I could see it combined with that other object. But generally I'm attracted to like very generic materials. So it could be also like a leftover from something else. Like I'm not, dra I'm not picking up things that already contain too much of a story or a personal intimate thing to it because I want to leave a very open narrative in my work and kind of the viewer to complete it with his own stories and I guess, yeah, I think I 
pick up. I mean, sometimes decisions are also like practical. Like there's some things that I just can't, you know, they could have bed bugs or they're like <laughs> too heavy to carry and I'm not in school anymore. When I was in school, my poor studio neighbors had to help me all the time, but then it gets harder. So things like that. Yeah. Casey, you want to tell us about your process? Um, yeah, I kind of feel as though I'm somewhere in between the two strategies. I have sketchbooks that I kind of bring out in the beginning when I'm thinking about possible ideas and compositions, but my sketchbook kind of goes beyond the actual sketchbook and becomes you know, a lot of research online and books, uh, a lot of screenshots, things like that, which I'll, I'll like put in my pocket and, and think about and, and, and I'll start playing with materials. And that's kind of my sketching uh, phase where I see, you know, how is this physically gonna work? How is it gonna stand up and actually hold some weight? Um, I think you can only get so far with drawing it two dimensionally and when you're working with you know, sculpture, you kind of have to play with the materials and, and feel your way out of, you know, whatever issues you have at the time. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, for me, sketchbooks come in different times of the, throughout the process of making artwork. Often I'll bring it back out to resolve issues and then I'll, you know, put it to the side, work again with the materials, and then at the end, um, often I'll have new ideas for how to further the project. And that's really when the sketchbook comes in, because uh, I have this, you know, all this material, all this experience that I can use as fuel for the next project or some sort of adaptation off of that project. Yeah. You were here for four days? putting together yeah, the days. works, right, four days. And I just wondered, over that four days, did you find that um, things changed sort of at some junctures while you were working, or did you already have everything sort of already mapped out in your head? How did that work? There's like certain um, rules that I keep in mind. Um, the, the installation was very much based on how, um, cities grow and how um, landscapes get populated and um, I have you know kind of ideas about how that works there's for example this general rule that um, uh, small towns will uh, grow with a 20 minute distance uh, from border to border uh, or end to end uh, just because that's you know, what a human feels comfortable with. So little towns will grow in 20 minute pockets. And so those type of things I have in mind, but also aesthetics, you know, you, you um, has to do with putting one piece next to another. And there's a huge difference when you put in that third piece. Mm -hmm. And so every day I would come in and it would, you know, pretty much be talking to me, telling me, you know, this is what needs to happen today. and. Um, at one point it just becomes its own monster, its own being, and you have to let it do what it needs to do, which is really nice because you feel as though responsibility is kind of off your shoulders and um, you see it becoming its own thing. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely, you know, I would come in here and just go into the little, my little hole and just start placing them. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you're always afraid also of, of going too far with a piece like that um, or not going far enough. Uh, and that's really where you have to stop thinking and just trust and, you know, intuition in that case is really important. Mm -hmm. Takes over. Yeah. <coughs> Well, I hadn't planned to ask about this, but um, a couple people mentioned this idea about abstraction. And we have an exhibition at the museum right now that looks specifically at the history of op and kinetic art. And it's an exhibition that explores the 1965 exhibition from the Museum of Modern Art called The Responsive Eye, 
which was the first sort of large-scale survey of up and kinetic art uh, in New York. It broke attendance records at the moment, like 240,000 people went to visit the exhibition. And part of the reason we wanted to revisit the exhibition is that uh, there is a history of leaving out certain parts of um, the globe, for example, in a discussion of abstraction and its development. And the response of I looked at an international group of artists who were responding to Op and Kinetic. Um, and out of the 107 or so works in the exhibition, um, or out of the 100 artists, I think, only five were from the Americas, from Latin America. Despite the fact that during the 60s, uh, many artists, hundreds of artists from all over Latin America were working in this way thinking about op art and thinking about abstraction <coughs> and had come from a tradition of geometric abstraction. In fact. <coughs> and so it's interesting to see how the centers of art move you know, from Paris to New York and to the Americas and then back. And since I see you know, this dialogue with abstraction um, in all of your work and in actually a lot of the exhibition in general, I wondered if you had any thoughts about you know, either how modernism has been presented to you while you were studying or your um, relationship to that history and how you adapt it for your own use or abstraction in general. Yeah, um, well, <clears throat> I the, the concept of abstract came early on when, uh, with, uh, while working as a photographer, I was also learning about how painters actually created abstract work. And I was uh, totally re physically removed from the, the process of painting in 1982, uh, 83. Uh, I became interested in it because my encounter with graph writers and my interest in graphic art actually um, spoke a lot about how you use space and how you can use like uh, emblematic structures and, and other kinds of language, in particular visual language, to play on positive and negative space to imply larger or smaller um, spaces being, uh, uh, or interventions. And so I started to, when I started to think about these pieces, uh, I, I thought about I, the ideas around Latin American art uh, early on, but I think my first um, ins inspirations were American artists. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what I was exposed to. And so it took some digging up, part of my identity research is like to find out what, who did what that is outside of Western thinking. And, um, and I always had an interest in optical art. Who doesn't, in a way, the way it, en it engages us, the way it, um, in, in my uh, situation. So I was thinking about a couple things, and um, I have memory lapses, so I make notes. Uh, so you know, I was thinking about the elements in which I kind of include my, in my compositions and, and the process. And uh, one of the things I was uh, recently studying uh, all forms of disruptive camouflage, whether how it's used in military, how it's part of nature, animal life, and I started thinking about also how I can shift my um, my my uh, my vision vertically and horizontally using this particular um, composition, and thinking about how uh, first I wanted it to be disruptive, but at the same time I wanted your eyes to kind of find certain places where you can rest. I don't know how many of you have actually engaged with this work or actually looked at it, but how it makes you feel. Uh, so what the idea to take on this corner was really a, quite an interesting challenge because uh, what I did visually was I inverted the corner so that it, literally your walls are moving away from you rather than coming towards you. And that was a, a, a challenge that I like to take on, I've been taking on for several works. Um, but I think the abstract language too is something that uh, you could bring, you can uh, create a work and then let your viewer kind of engage with it and, and bring something to it as well. It's, it's a narrative, but it's, not, it's always open, and, uh, and at least in my case, it's not really, I'm not really weighed down by uh, the rhetorical elements of it, but really I'm more interested in the visual play. Yeah, I think for me, I want the work to be abstracted enough from reality so that it could have this kind of bizarre nature to it or tendency, uh, something that's a little bit off-putting, something that's a little bit off, but I want to keep it firmly within reality. 
not like go all the way to abstraction because I think um, at least for what I'm talking about and the themes in my work, I think it's important to uh, draw the viewer back into some form of reality and jot, um, start you know, producing um, uh, real life experiences in the brain rather than uh, letting it become an escapism, you know, just, oh, this is so far removed from reality that it's, it's an, a vacation. I don't want it to be that. For me, my art has to relate to reality and issues of the day, and in order to do that, you, for me at least, I can't go all the way to abstraction. Mm -hmm. I, I can relate to that, but in my case, because I'm working with, ob like, sometimes with objects that already have a very specific meaning or are clearly a very specific object, I think I try to, I think of abstraction as a way to get away from the object a little bit, but then just the object will balance it in the, in the same way that you were saying, so that it, it has the right tension between being this completely abstract thing. I mean, I do think in a painterly way when I'm arranging things and aesthetics and color and composition are very important in my work, I think. I mean, I think about those things and I, I have a tendency to try to abstract everything and I'm attracted to abstract painting and things like that. But I think because the object is always there, like that kind of balances it on its own. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I would want to say, um, I kind of try to abstract more like ritualized kind of actions um, that are found like in performance, like in like festivals or street festivals. Um, so I guess my abstractions come with trying to WTF the other, the audience member <laughs> and try to like just keep them engaged longer than like three, five, six seconds. And so because usually, you know, you go to a museum, you're like, oh, great, great, great. And so how to just keep uh, the audience uh, thinking um, about the form, about the signified elements used uh, within the sculpture, um, and then try to make it more of an ephemeral kind of situation rather than trying to say, oh, this is what this is about. Uh, I get it. It sucks. I'm going to go look at something else. <laughs> and so that was kind of important as far as just um, always working with other uh, artists when it comes to performance and utilizing the sculptures as, uh, as abstracted forms just to keep uh, the embodiment of the spirit of the sculpture alive. Um, because I think I just, sh I primarily just exhibit like sculptures. And most of those sculptures are kind of Baroque style, decorative style, uh, or just like this, like an FU to min minimalism or, or, or something that's happening. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, like a more is more aesthetic. <laughs> I keep going, you know. <laughs> but you also have some sculptures where you specifically incorporated some of your small hard edge drawings mm -hmm. uh, that are very sort of geometric in their... Yeah, usually the... N now the drawings, instead of like out of boredom, is more like, okay, the job is uh, this location. And in this location, there's going to be a certain audience. And then I have my kind of emotional and intellectual baggage that I have based on my perception of that audience that's gonna be there. So then what I like to do is flip that world upside down so then they actually uh, see like reality or, or simple truth that no one wants to talk about. Like, oh, it's great to see you, but you really hate that person, you know? <laughs> or like stuff like that and just try to bring that kind of element out into the work. Um, I have no idea if I answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Oh, sorry. Um, my next question is sort of like a combination of the environment of both school and New York City and I wondered how much 
uh, being in school influence your work or changed your idea about what you were going to do? Did you go in thinking you were going to do one kind of thing and then end up with something completely different? And how much did living and working in New York impact uh, those those turnouts, let's say? Well, um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to live in Newark where I was able to commute into New York before I started um, SVA. And um, I had some kind of, I was touching in already with some of the elements that were happening in, art, in the art world. Not very interested in what was happening except for the graph scene. Um, but uh, my first year at SVA from 2082 to 83, I had a real rude awakening about how there was a certain s social uh, disconnect. Um, being in Newark and then coming, leaving Newark and coming into New York really uh, showed me a few things. One, that we were, I felt very different. Not that I wasn't part of uh, humanity, but I felt very different culturally. At SVA, there were only three Boricuas, right? Two of them actually I met and two were, were from Arts High School where I graduated. I graduated from high school in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, one of the first uh, arts dedicated high schools and then um, ironically enough, we all ended up leaving the same year. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I had started to pursue the Words of Newark project back then called Newark People, where I was getting some interesting write-ups in the New York Times. Vivian Rayner, who's no longer with us, um, was pursuing my work in some way. Um, I knew nothing of her. There was no way I could contact her. And eventually, what happened was several years later, I acquired my first New, New Jersey State Arts Council grant to pursue this project. Um, I already knew I want, what I wanted to do, but New York was definitely inspirational because it was, a huge, it was a huge city, lots of things were happening. I had a short stint with the Guardian Angels around 1981 to 1983, where I met Curtis Sliwa and I was able to kind of negotiate the subways with the Guardian Angels and had access to their headquarters. So that kind of like opened up my eye to like, my eyes too. This is real. For me, this was real social justice. These were people who were trying to do something real. And at the same time, um, I had access to what was happening. I was, uh, you know, um, I would, I'd learn what it was like to get on the two, the two or three train, get into the, go to the Bronx, know nobody there, get off the train, be in a totally desolate area and be able to record some of the things I was seeing. Um, and so it kind of informed my work. It also showed me that we were actually, those, the, the boroughs and Newark were, had a lot in common, both socially, economically, and some of the struggles that we were experiencing in Newark th through Reaganomics were happening in, in New York, in the boroughs of the Bronx, which I knew nothing about in the way I was so isolated, but coming out informed my work. And um, it was really, uh, it was it was not only eye-opening, but it opened up my spirit to just understand that this was a place where I needed to be. That I, this was, a, as I wrote today, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to leave SVA to follow these other subcultures that I never would have pursued if, in fact, I had stayed in academia. Now, I have my other issues with not uh, with some of the things that uh, was happening in the school too. There were some other, um, let's say other uh, emotional social issues that there was no, uh, there wasn't enough, there wasn't adequate support for students like myself. First time, first generation, p to parents from, work, uh, from a strictly working class family. Uh, and so it was, there was kind of a, a burden on my shoulder to be the first one to graduate. But at the same time, I also found out that there are all these other alternatives way to pursue my art, which actually led me to greater places. Because I opened my mind up to the idea that the restrictions of being in an academic uh, uh, structure or institution was just that. It was, for some people, it was liberating. For others, it wasn't. Uh, and for me, it certainly wasn't. And it provided me with at least with a a sounding board to understand that there was all this other stuff happening which I can embrace and kind of pursue on my own without being in the social structure of the school. Um, but as a result, a lot of things opened up. Maybe things that would never happen today. Like today you can't just go into a gallery and say, here are my slides. 
it's summertime, it's August. I'd meet James Elaine at the Drawing Center. I'm here today, you should look at my work. Oh, of course, I'll look at your work, great. So I, I passed the pile, right? And he says, uh, you're included in section, uh, selection 50. Are well, you interested, of course. So, you know, those things won't happen now. So I was fortunate enough that I can literally knock on people's doors and show them my work and say I'm really serious about what I do. And so if I, hadn't, if I had pursued SVA like a good student, I wouldn't have gotten where I, where I was going. And actually my career was accelerated because of it. But I'm very unique in that way. I wouldn't recommend, I don't recommend to any of my students. <laughs> You know, I was just blessed that I had multiple intelligences that can take me into all these different places and allow me to function as an artist. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it's long-winded, but I hope it was good. Uh, well, I definitely decided to go to SVA with the, the idea that I was going to change my art. You know, I, I was one of those artists that felt that I needed grad school to push my artwork to the next level. Um, and so SVA really did that. I, I had an idea in mind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to explore installation art. I wanted to make work that was immersive rather than something that was passive on the wall or could be passive. Um, and so I definitely went into it with the idea that my work needs a dramatic change and it was great you know you had all these amazing artists there ready and able to talk about artwork and really criticize it and that's what I needed and that's what I got at SVA just a critical critical eye um, and just time to question you know why are you doing what you're doing why are you making this and not something else when you know, being in New York City, there's so many influences, there's so much to see and to love and to hate, and there's just so much going on in this city that it's easy to get lost in it and lose your art in that process. And so having those two years to really question everything, almost like in a Cartesian way where there's no certainty in anything, you know? Um, was uh, really good and really important um, and definitely something that I, I needed. But I know of so many uh, colleagues and artists that felt the opposite. You know, they went into these institutions and they felt as though they had a firm grasp on every uh, part of their art practice. So this was just a constraint, you know, so. <coughs> so um well, I actually didn't have a degree in art before I went to SVA, so my undergrad, I'm from Chile, and back home I went to business and economy school <laughs> for five years. So um, I can't really answer, like I can't split, split it apart and see how much SVA and how much New York changed my work. I think it's partly both. Like, when I first got in, actually a year before I started my MFA here, I did a summer residency program that they have at SVA, which is like a one month immersive thing that a lot of people from all over come and do. And that was like a key thing for me because like it was my first time in New York as like an artist and spending a month working here. And I still remember, like, I was so shocked by the piles of trash, just by the way that all these bags would pile up. And I didn't really come from a culture where, like, first of all, things are passed along. So, like, if you have an old sofa or TV that you decided to upgrade, you're going to find someone who wants it. Or, and it's not going to be a big deal because someone's going to come with their car and pick it up. Well, here maybe people have the intention of giving it away, but then who will pick it up and how? So it's easier to like just put it on the street. So that spoke a lot to me about, you know, obviously consumerism and the lifetime of objects and also space and how lack of space kind of was like the third element to that never ending circle of like buying and throwing away and, you know. 
So I think uh, when I came to SV, that residency made me start working with objects. Before that, I was more of an abstract painter, I guess, and my experience in New York made me start wanting to do the street interventions and then eventually like grabbing some of these objects into the street. And I guess when I started my MFA, I was already doing a little bit of that kind of work. So SVA just like kind of reinforced that I was on a path that felt very true and honest as to what I wanted to communicate as an artist. Mm -hmm. What was the exact question again? <laughs> <laughs> it was really about the, right? the nexus of school and New York. New York right, and the impact. right. Um, <laughs> I, was in, I was in UC Boulder in the mountains, um, you know, token on top of the hill, but really bored. And so it's just like, okay, go to the city. You have everything here. You know, you have the artists, the studios, the sex, the dancing, the drugs. <laughs> That's why I came and then just creating that kind of like network of people who wanted to just come here and just be immersed in those five elements. And then if you're, if you're with those kind of like key people, everyone is helping each other. And I think that's what you were touching on as far as like finding a, a community. So like here, like every kind of person kind of exists. Mm -hmm. If you're leaving Ohio or whatever, or Chile or, you know, you have every kind of thought process happening here. So that, that's why I came here and, and, uh, and I hang out with artists because we have the most fun, I think, out of <laughs> everyone. I All think. the professions, yes. Um, so do you yes, have any help. questions for each other? Anybody on the panelists about your work? Or well, actually, I have a question about color because color is so important to you. But it seems to be very much <coughs> a specific palette. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking, how did you get to that palette, or was it just you know you kind of just always choose those colors, <laughs> 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 or is it something that you thought? I, I think, I mean, it's a very clear palette, but it's not like I had a specific idea behind it, but I've thought, I was just using those colors, and I've thought about why do I use those colors, and I mean, I, I grew up like in the 80s, and so there's a big influence of that, but also when I grew up in Chile and I would come visit my gra my grandparents were living in Miami at the time. So like all these like neon or glittery or like super bright colors were things that at that time I would associate with like my my yearly visit to my grandparents in Miami. So I guess there's a little bit of that when I moved here and I actually had access to all of that forever, you know, endlessly. Mm -hmm. Before those would be like the neon pen that I would treasure and I wouldn't <laughs> share it with anyone in school, you know. And now I just, w there was like an overabundance mm -hmm. of it too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why. But now it became like, I think it also has to do with this idea of like, obviously when I was when I started working with these things that were like dirty and mm. trashy and some of them black or whatever, like I just felt like a way to also bring them back to life was by using these very <coughs> contrasty colors. Mm. And so I think it's a mixture of those two things. Thank you for your question. <laughs> you are more than Alejandro, I was actually thinking about the, your use of symbology, um, particular um, kind of like esoteric or um, religious symbology, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. did you grow up in a religious household that you had to kind of embrace certain uh, theology and then yeah. and just fight off, or was mm -hmm. it something, just be, or something you just embraced and you kind of kept it going through your work? Um, I guess more, it was more about like, um, I forgot who it was. It was uh, Albert Chong, as a Jamaican uh, artist, yeah. and he always said it was uh, important for uh, an artist to create your own language. And so, what you do, or at least what I did, was just try to figure out your own language. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I 
some of the older work has certain uh, like Ana Furanas that are like kind of like a, like a cosmogram. Um, but yeah, I was just trying to figure out my own language, I guess. And then with that, I guess I don't really do that style anymore, and that's why I put it in there because it was like undergraduate stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and out of like social frustration of just saying, okay, I guess just to use uh, to go back with the word uh, you use spite, out of social frustration of just doing what everyone knew, um, you know, how do I make a green Oreo instead of you know, I don't know, a white or something. I don't know. <laughs> so it was just how to come up with something new, I guess, through repetition, stick with what you know, and then through the evolution of just just being bored of doing the same thing over and over again and doing the same performance over and over again, um, you'll just get better, just naturally, through repetition, I guess. I think that answered it. Yeah? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to um, invite the audience to ask questions, so I'm just going to uh, throw one final question out that's for the panelists, but also for the audience. This is a question that I get asked all the time, and so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to ask other people this question. Um, this exhibition is really a sort of a survey of um, artists who have come out of the MFA program at SVA, but the underpinnings of the exhibition have to do with a very specific mission for my institution, which is to support artists from Latin America, but also Latino artists born in the US. And so I have two sort of prong question, anyone can jump in. Um, are exhibitions like this relevant? And the associated question is, are culturally specific or ethnically specific institutions still relevant today? <laughs> well, I would say that I think it's wrong to say, <coughs> put everyone in a box. Oh, these are the Latino artists, these are the African American artists, and at the end of the day, these are the Caucasian artists. It just becomes too reductive and silly. But I also think that there's, you know, if you look at what's being shown out there, there's a lot of white males being represented, and I think it's important to make sure that the, the balance is, you know, tilted the other way a bit. Um, I just, I think that's, that's why institutions like El Barrio and Museo is so important because there, it's not that long ago where Latin art was, didn't really have a, much of a voice, at least not in the public sphere, and I think institutions like this is, it's the only way forward, really, at least in the beginning. Um, yeah. I feel like when you, when you have a studio visit, like I've had a lot of studio visits where people go like, how does your Chilean background show in your work or stuff like that? And I usually am like, you know, I, I, I think these institutions, these shows and these associations among cultures or, or whatever, like make you, just think about those questions. Like, I grew up in Chile. I, I mean, maybe I don't look like super Latino. My last name isn't la like, so usually I have those kind of, uh, qu I, I face that question a lot. And I actually like to say, like, yes, I am from Chile. And my work, I mean, a lot of what I'm doing, maybe it doesn't have to have the embroidery that, you know, people are doing in the, mountain to be Chilean, but I do think like what I make has to do with where I grew up and the, whatever the way my family showed me things, I mean that's ultimately what you are. So I like institutions and shows like this because they make you feel part of something and I think that's important and it doesn't mean you cannot be part of other associations too, or, but they're just, I think they act as a survey for what we have in common. I mean, we grew up in different places, maybe with less or closer or, or whatever, like Latin American ties, but if you see the show, like there are connections among people's work, I think, so. Yeah. Well, fortunately, um, we have institutions like our museo and studio museum 
other institutions in the United States that started about 40 years ago, and a little later, a little earlier. Uh, uh, however, if it wasn't for, um, for me, for Al Museo, the introduction to Al Museo, knowing about it, and finding it in the early 90s, just having access to an institution that actually, when I walked in there, I related, you know, the language, the, the use of uh, just the visual vocabularies that I encountered, the artists I, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to witness, and then just kind of thinking about myself, not feeling like I was out of the box in, anymore, anymore, like feeling like there was a larger community that I was unaware of. Um, that was really informative, and then I was able to turn other people onto it because most people didn't know what, uh, in my community, people didn't know what almost de Barrio was. It was very foreign, the idea that someone's dedicated to, you know, the uh, the diaspora, the Caribbean diaspora, and just being able to talk about the social, economic, and political issues of the day, and just how that is, is informing artists today. Um, and and it's relevant because we have to write our own histories because there, there's been so much revisionist history within the Western historical uh, gaze and just, and uh, the idea that um, all of us were brought up with these histories that are very biased that we'll probably never be able to undo, uh, whether they're truths or whether they're lies. And so anything else that would inform my work, I welcomed because I knew that something was happening in my community around and the people I was uh, encountering every day that felt displaced, it was fractured. Um, and then encountering arts institutions like El Museo to kind of come back and say, oh, these people are actually talking about the same social political situations that I'm interested in. They just vocalize it differently and it just gave me a whole new breath, just the opportunity to learn how I can talk about uh, ideas that were around social commentary through my work as well. Any thoughts from the audience or questions from the audience for the panelists? If you have a question, <coughs> can you speak it into this, which is not amplified, but it's for the video. <laughs> 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 I'm the first person who doesn't get a choice. I have to ask you something now. Um, <laughs> actually, initially when you were discussing um, looking at historical references, I was curious if you could expand on um, the dazzle concept, the the military use of, you know, they did this kind of op art on ships in order to um, make it difficult to pinpoint where things were. Right. And I know you're disrupting space and you're saying something like that, but is there something more political beyond that than just a reference? Oh no, well the reference, no, actually this, you know, this is titled Cutoff, so there's actually text embedded in the piece, I don't know if you can read it, but basically, what I do is I, I take architectonic forms and I break them apart to the point where um, there, I, um, I like to uh, play very strongly on the negative space, so I incorporate the color of the wall, so basically what happens is this, uh, the idea of cutting the cut off concept came when um, I started thinking about all these personal experiences where I felt cut off and I felt marginalized, where I isolated myself. And then I started thinking about these adventure playgrounds that were, um, that were um, starting to be built in England after World War II, where basically children and adults got together and they took these empty, these derelict estates and built these wonderful playgrounds that were these big obstacles. So then I, I, I said, wow, it would be really interesting if I can create an obstacle course for adults where you basically experience this word, like let's say cut off, what, what if this was three dimensional? And then now you have to navigate through the word. So the metaphor, it's obvious, you know, we're navigating through language, language becomes abstract, complicated, layered. And so I present something that visualizes that. Um, so in this case, you know, what would be your entry point to this piece, or is there an entry point for you? I mean, initially I'd read left to right as a, from Western education, so I do start from the left, but I, the arrow indicators can shoot you off like in any direction. Right. So you have to bring yourself back in. Right. So that's part of, uh, that's also part of the disruptive uh, concept. You know, it's not just visually disruptive, but the, your spatial perception of this piece shifts too. So when you stand up, 
um, when you look at this cut, so here's the C, kind of you could read it, the U becomes semi-transparent, so you have this multiple kind of uh, planar U, and the T doubles, physically doubles, and then you have this empty space that takes you out, and the off is the O, and then there's these two little abstracts as kind of like the carpet. Uh, so the idea is that, um, so your parallax, you have to adjust your eye. So if you look at it from that point of view, this collapses and that becomes fully open to you. And the opposite happens when you look at it from, let's say, directly from that audience point of view. So you can somewhat recut, but cut, uh, but off just collapses as well. So, um, so it's not always what you, what you think you're seeing is not actually happening. It depends on your perception and how you navigate around it. And for me, language has been like that all my life, the English language in particular. I grew up speaking Spanish first, but then I was, my parents were told that that's, no, that's a no-no. You need to send them outside, let them speak English, and then English became my dominant language, but I always felt like it didn't. So it was kind of like this kind of teetering between the two, but I became more fluent with the English. But the, again, navigating through language is always interesting, that concept that I could physically present it, something visual, tangible, yet not always clear and always complicated for me. It's always been something I've struggled with. And part of that is that I, I self-diagnosed with dyslexia, so one of the things I internalized is that how do I, by the time I was 18, 19 years old, I had to kind of start undoing that I didn't have a support system, so I had to kind of consult with just a couple people and start unpacking these things that were like, uh, what am I gonna do with this thing? But I was able to kind of face it and, and, and slowly work through it. So the, 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 the disruptiveness has a lot to do, and the cutoff, the idea of the cutoff had a lot to do with feeling cut off at a certain point and then just needing to get back on to determine where my new direction was. And that's why I kind of play around with perspective. I kind of force the, the direction on you and force that, those planar shapes on you so that you are, you're kind of battling with it, but at the same time, there's something about it that's exciting. You know, there's two things happening, I think, when you look at this work. There's one that disengages, well not disengage, but disrupts things, and another one actually that entertains you or, or, or excites you. So, I don't know if that makes sense, however. No. Congratulations for the exhibition. Um, I want to say that uh, I support the mission of the museum, El Museo del Barrio, but on the other hand, personally, as a South American, I feel that the terminology Latino is colonial, is racist. And when I, when I was in graduate school here in New York City, uh, some white American students, anytime they see my work, because I was next to my work, they were, oh, Latin American art. And when people said to me that I am Latino artist or Latin American art, automatically they are killing thousands of years of tradition and Native American culture that we have in the entire continent. And, uh, um, and for that reason, I believe that probably if we really want to make a strong statement about people of color art or the other art or whatever you want to call it, Definitely, as a Latinos in the United States, we have to, in some way, invite or open the doors to the Native American contemporary art, because we are Native Americans too. That's my only comment. Everybody shy. Okay, good. There's a question over here. Thanks. So this is for uh, this is for Manuel, but also for Rocio. I want to ask you about El Museo's mission. Do you would you also include the Caribbean as part of the mission of El Museo's uh, audience in terms of who it's intending to represent with Latin America and U.S.-based Latinos? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I mean, so that I think that's an important sort of distinction also to include the Caribbean, which has been a part of uh, El Museo's original mission for a long time. Um, Mike, this is a question for you, Manuel. 
what, what year were you, were you in the MFA program at SBA or the BFA program? Uh, no, I was a, it was my first year. I was just, I was just, I was 18, 19 years old. I was just a, a freshman. So, but what, what was the year? Do you remember what year? 82, 83. 82, 83. So, like, you mentioned the Guardian Angels, you know, for example, I don't even know if people know who the Guardian Angels are here, but um, do you, can you explain who the Guardian Angels uh, are? Well, basically, the Guardian, Guardian Angels were kind of a, a bump off, no kidding. Uh, basically, what it was, it was a group of uh, young people led by uh, uh, Curtis and Lisa Sliwa. I think they were, I think they were Polish descent. Somehow they got this idea to create the street patrol. And the street patrol was loosely trained by um, guys that I knew who would break, who would come to practice, like we studied a little martial arts. Uh, one guy would come to practice with his hands all crusty, be like, well, what were you doing? I was just breaking some bricks. And the, those kinds of martial artists, um, they were kind of esoteric people who just kind of had this knowledge that they acquired, uh, studied martial arts, Though it was in, in, uh, in uh, black communities in Newark, martial arts was like it. You had to study martial arts. That was something that you did. And then, uh, and so basically what we did was we trained and we patrolled the subways. There was no use of weaponry. Uh, all you can do is basically if you saw something, you apprehended that person. Uh, and hopefully there was a cop on that platform because if it was, it was going to turn into a big fight. And normally, we, we patrolled in uh, groups of eight people, men and women patrolled. Uh, so we just kind of like spread out. So it'd, it'd be like a guardian angel for each train, for each train, literally. And then we just, every time the train stopped, we looked, at, looked down, make sure everybody was OK, and then we'd proceed. Um, and so that it was an interesting experience for me. It was like a, a social practice that I didn't know was a social practice. It was like, oh, OK, I'm going to get involved in this. And uh, actually opened my, uh, my eyes up to, again, needing, talking about security, you know, physical security, vulnerability, being a person of color or in, in these communities where you just felt threatened. And so it was kind of a way to empower myself and to learn more about what others were doing to, 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 um, to protect their community in some ways. Mostly around our, you know, domestic issues, and very few foreigners would come out. So sometimes we patrol the, the projects. We were never welcomed. Someone would always throw some bottles from somewhere because you could never see where they were throwing the stuff from, or throw it off a roof, or you know, it was fun. But um, uh, but it was a learning experience. Yes. So, but the reason I, the reason I brought it up was well for a little bit of context, but also your your experience is really is a little bit different. Like your your New York is a different New York yeah. than than your uh, colleagues on the panels experience, just right. generationally speaking. So the early '80s in New York, Guardian Angels were also very stylistic, right? Red braids, red silk jackets. Very very influenced by you know the Young Lords and the Panthers. Very very sort of like derivative of like the Young Lords and the Black Panthers yeah. kind of stylistically, but they were sort of like community policing the trains and the streets and um, and and they had they had a very cool sort of aesthetic and they were they were sort of like out for justice right um, for the community um, so but what's interesting to me hearing you talk about that was that they wore red and black right yeah red black and white yeah right and and so we have this big piece behind you but also what's interesting to me is that part of what New York looked like and the trains looked like in the 80s were, the trains were full of graffiti yes. right? And so, which was also, you know, uh, criminalized, especially yeah. during those years. So it made me wonder, like, what that experience was like in terms of how graffiti as an art form uh, and sort of the early sort of years of hip hop in New York City is being sort of policed by this kind of like uh, community police or not being policed and where your experience as an artist fit in with that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I was kind of, it's unique. I mean, I was blessed that I was able to be a witness of what was happening in New York because what happened was Curtis Lee wanted to start a chapter in Newark, New Jersey, which they did. The first guardian angel that was ever killed on the line of duty was killed in Newark, New Jersey by a police officer on a rooftop. So that also, that, 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 uh, that triggered protests. Um, and uh, um, you know they marched. They wanted a special prosecutor, so the guardian angels marched from from Newark to Trenton. Uh, I participated in some of that, 
Uh, and then there was just this, like, this need in the community to just have our own people, people that look like us, patrol us, or at least look over us. Uh, often, like years ago, if you were a cop on a beat, you usually got to know who that cop was. You walked the street, you talked to him, sometimes they'd sit on your porch, sometimes they wouldn't, but it was really different. Now, it's, policing is entirely different. It's done through surveillance cameras and, and this total disconnect to, to, to the community itself, I think. Um, and even though the cops were quote unquote Caucasian, uh, going into my neighborhood, there was always a certain amount of kind of distance and I would say some, some respect. I w it helped also that I had a councilman that, uh, Ronald Rice, who was an ex-police officer. So my community also had another community of ex-police officers that patrolled. So this is all this interesting stuff happening in Newark. Um, and so the golden age of graffiti actually informed all of us. And uh, ironically enough, 30 plus years later, now we're looking at it with this great awe and this like, you know, how it's also inspired all forms of uh, art, form, all art forms, from music to writing to, um, you know, to visual arts, name it, to theater, to film. There's nothing about what we look at anymore that doesn't have that street kind of like edge to it. Hip hop. Artists, had a lot were the guardian angels like then? Were they busting graffiti artists for that stuff back then too? Back then, uh, no. We participated in it. <laughs> um, some guys that I know were busted one time. There was an incident. I could be wrong, but one guy was doing armed robberies after he take off his uh, uniform. So there was a, few, you know, there were people doing other things too. Uh, I'm not saying that they were corrupt. I'm saying that they're, that the, once in a while we had the same element. It's kind of like a police officer, a friend of mine who says, in order for you to be a police officer, you have to think like a criminal. And some of them act like criminals. So, you know, that happened as well. They, you know what, they, you might see one once in a while. It's like a unicorn in the city, but they, <laughs> yeah, it is a unicorn. There I are, saw one two weeks ago. Like, yeah, there, there are a couple around. <laughs> Just a couple. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? I just have one quick final thought, which was Manuel was recalling that there were three Boricuas in 1982 when he went to SVA. And um, in the most recent version of the Whitney Biennial, there were also three Boricuas. And so I think that, you know, one of the reasons that specific institutions remain relevant is that there continues to be an erasure or um, uh, an, un apartado, like a, a leaving aside of artists that represent specific groups. And I just wanted to reiterate how uh, grateful I am to SVA, to the MFA program for providing us this space and this yeah. platform and this opportunity mm -hmm. to put all of these artists together um, in an exhibition that I hope you'll enjoy now for the last few minutes that we have. Thank you all so much for Thank coming. You.